This is Tuttle Creek Reservoir. It's a large reservoir on the Big Blue River that originates uh, in Nebraska and then comes down into Kansas and eventually a few kilometers down from here runs into the Kansas River, empties into the Kansas River. As you can see, this is a fairly turbid reservoir. Um, historically, it probably, uh, the water was probably fairly clear in this area. Um, the Big Blue River, the Fremont Expedition, noted that it was a clear and handsome stream. And now it pretty much runs turbid all the time. As a result, this reservoir is, is fairly rapidly filling up with sediment. It's, it, it's quite long, um, and there's over a 10 kilometer, uh, 10 kilometer fetch, um, but the top part is really, is really about a third full of sediment. Um, the deepest part of this reservoir is along that far shore, and that's where we usually go to sample this lake. It's about 13 meters deep. Because of the long fetch, we get really strong wave action, and that wave action can lead to waves up to two meters high. And particularly here, if you, if, uh, specifically here, if you had wind coming out of the north, out of that direction, um, along the longest axis of the lake, the fetch, it would, it would create fairly large waves uh, along the dam. The outlet of the dam is over here, and it is a, a deep release outlet, and then enters into the river below. You can see the shoreline of this lake has uh, not much vegetation, and that's because the water level goes way up and down. This is a flood control reservoir, um, and that doesn't allow any real vegetation to, to establish on the sides of the bank. In 1993, the, flood, the reservoir got so high it went over the spillway, which we're walking towards right now. So now we're at the spillway. And so in 93, as I mentioned, they had to raise those gates and, and open them up and let the water go down through them. As it carved through the canyon, it, it um, uncovered some really interesting geological formations, some stromatolites and some ancient shark teeth were formed there, found there. In addition, you can see here on the far hillside, there's a little yellow arrow up there, and that's pointing out where there's a fault in these hills. And so, uh, unfortunately, they built this reservoir on top of a fault. So the last several years, they've been reinforcing the reservoir because it was uh, in a highly dangerous condition if there was ever an earthquake associated with that fault. So these, this is a spillway. You can get a lot better idea of the scale here. Those uh, gates will just swing up uh, to let the water out. As I was talking about before, there's a lot of sediment in here. Um, the water quality is somewhat dismal in this reservoir because of all the sediment, but also all the cropland upstream, in addition to washing sediment in, there's a huge pulse of atrazine um, uh, herbicide that comes in through, through the uh, springtime as it washes in here. The nutrients are also quite high, and if it were not for the sediment knocking the chlorophyll down and making the photosynthesis unavailable, excuse me, making the light unavailable for photosynthesis, there'd be very large algal blooms in this reservoir. Milford Reservoir, which is just to the next large reservoir to the west of here, has toxic cyanobacterial blooms developing regularly. The reason for that being is that it comes out of a more sandy rather than a clayey uh, watershed. And so even though there's agriculture upstream, the uh, clay doesn't work its way into the system and so the algae is not light limited. Instead, the nutrients really allow for very large blooms of cyanobacteria. The other thing about the large fetch in this lake is that it does not allow it to stratify. Um, the mixing is, is enough that it just can't build a temperature differential such that the bottom is, um, forms a hypolimnion or a metalimnion as do smaller lakes and ponds in the area with a smaller fetch. 